hopefully you've got the full screen now. Everybody keep yes. it good? Good. Yes. Perfect. Okay. All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, it's going to be um, quite interesting, this presentation, I hope, for you guys. Um, I've just been basically zipping through. There is a link um, that I put up as a kind of like website uh, resource. I sent it through to Pindi and to Diego, so they can uh, send that all through to onto the chat screen or whatever they like now. And that will bring up um, the first part of the uh, presentation, kind of like contents. Later on, I will also include this content uh, halfway through, probably. If anybody of you have got a um, smartphone, you can just uh, scan the QR scan code and it should come up. But anyway, enough of the technical stuff. Let's go through what we're going to talk to about today. Uh, and the issue that we're all talking about or dealing with at the time with our, our work, it's constantly, you know, the nature of the osteopathic lesions. So um, I'm just going to go through some aspects of that, plus some kind of like a little bit of EB evidence-based material or research-based material that's kind of like you know, a development on some of the themes and a bit of a timeline relating to that too. I hope people get enough done in time. Okay, so let's have a look at what we're going to do. It's a few subject matters here. A lot of the time it's kind of like reviewing interesting material um, relating to every, everyday activities in our clinics um, and um, also specifically relating to some aspects of lesion, lesion theory and some contributors to that. And also some new ideas and concepts relating to uh, the idea of uh, the lesion in its, con in, in its contemporary context, the, the terminology somato, somato, somato uh, dysfunction, somatic dysfunction is a term coins to some degree. And even that one nowadays is being slightly um, necessarily challenged but uh, reviewed in terms of the context of whether it's been uh, considered to be um, a little bit too confrontational for uh, some some dialogue between patients when you're relating to the idea of uh, the dysfunction. But anyway, let's go on to uh, some aspects of today's lecture. So what we're going to look at this is, let's have a look at some of idea of Little John stuff. Um, I put a few of these things already up on my Facebook page over the last month's stuff of people being um, relating to that. You can be very welcome to look at that sometime too. So let's have a look at what Little John really talks about relating to this whole concept. You know, 1996, 1966 yearbook, applied physiology, effectively, we're not just purely talking about the, the, the osteopathic lesion as, as, as a, an osseous or structural scenario. And this, I think, is something what eventually we've got to bring across as classical osteopaths, but also as osteopaths, that we're not just purely dealing with that structural phenomenon, although unfortunately we've got to be, it's been kind of like put into that category, into that little box um, by many other people and considered to just be purely based on the postural dynamics of the patient and you know what's happening in terms of the osteous bony lesion and it's far more than that as you will see. So let's have a look at this um, little page snippet that I grabbed from um, Little John's quotes um, in, in the 96 application, uh, publication. Um, from the Institute of Applied Technique, as it used to be called years ago, now the Institute yeah. of Classical Osteopathy. Um, let's have a look at this first section. Basically, the principle of therapeutics is established about freedom of irritation from obstruction and compression in connection with all parts of the organism. So there's a lot we're looking at. What are we dealing with in terms of the context of the lesion? This end, we apply a means of manipulation. Well, nature of manipulation. First of all, we're looking at soft tissues because we're connecting the structures. Soft tissues are connecting the structures that we're dealing with. And most importantly, we're looking at the nature of the uh, tissue uh, response or tissue expression as a consequence of you know, that typical lesion uh, representation. Um, of course, the first thing we've got to do within the context of our treatment is not just go straight in to try and m mobilize and free up that interosseous or a lot of uh, le le lesion uh, respect, perspective, but, but to actually deal with the actual expression of the tissues relating to that mechanism of that lesion field or that lesion structure itself or, or lesion component itself. So we're looking at releasing these things and we're looking at releasing tensions and uh, ligamentous and from fashion soft tissue uh, aspects of that, as you can see in this presentation on the first page. So let's have a look at that. This is a typical nice image from um, some of the film of uh, John Wernham doing just that within the context of the body adjustment. We are de dealing with appealing to the tissues, the soft tissues that in all planes and using that Libra, the subtle Libra fulcrum application to achieve that ends, um, including the context of uh, you know, within the body adjustment, both supine, prone, sideline applications. We don't necessarily go straight in and provide a 
you know, an adjustive aspect in terms of a, a, a strong application. The application is very subtle. It's guided by the, the sub tissues and also the nature and dynamic of movement within those tissues and joint structures that we're dealing with. So let's go on from there. We're then going on from the stage of that dealing with the next stage, more of the hard tissues, the actual contact of tissue with the various structures, the ligaments, the cartilage structures themselves. But at the same time, dealing with the, the nature of the associated structures within that, that domain, not purely working on you know, mobilizing a joint structure for, for its own sake, but relating to that integration of that tissue in terms of the, its, its, its relationship to other structures in its proximity, but also the whole you know, unity of the body as well. So again, you know, one of the things we can see here is me um, demonstrating just one aspect of a, an, an approach to a lumbar uh, scenario where we might want to provide ease of uh, tissue contractility or, or muscular tension or, or the, the nature of improving the, the degree of mobility within the actual you know, articular structures and interarticular structures themselves. So you go, you know, disengaging that typical tripod of the, of the facets in relationship to the to the body of the vertebra and the disc itself, but within the context of you know, a physiological movement, not just purely a mechanicalized decompression. So again, we're dealing with these components. And again, then we're looking at, you know, preparing the actual tissue field for adjustment, not just purely going in um, uh, without, without some degree of uh, uh, rationale behind our work. So this is another scenario that we're dealing with within that context, again, you know, Dealing with that component, here's John Wall, you know, effectively providing indication of the need for um, an adjustment of the pelvis, the baseline of the spine, but you know, relating into that context of the preparation that has done to be done before, not just treated in isolation. So again, when we look at these lines, these sentences, we discover that you know every single paragraph has a specific content relating to that whole idea that we're looking at. You know, not just purely working on the dynamic of the joint structure in the cells, but the whole unity of the body. And looking at that, you know, the idea that this, the actual domain of the treatment doesn't just stay within the context of the patient, but within it, the patient's uh, environment and, and, and what we call now, of course, the biopsychosocial domain of the patient itself. So this is, you know, something that was brought across, you know, by Little John in the past and is now being, you know, again, re rediscovered or reviewed and looked at in context of what we're doing within our treatment. And we don't, you know, ignore this factor. We're looking at that as a component of the actual uh, lesion, uh, lesion, um, lesion dynamic itself. So anything from changing the posture and, and the working environment of the patient through to, you know, giving direct gentle counsel in relationship to certain aspects of lifestyle and diet Etc. Certain sort of components of, of, of the life as much as we can do, and giving a, a dialogue which is constructive isn't creating that typical kind of like catastrophizing phenomenon where people have said are saying you know these conditions are bad. You know this is due to the fact that there's a disturbance in your neck. Okay, there may be a disturbance in the neck, but you know that's kind of like localizing and giving it a, an identity that is kind of like, you know can be you know um, unfortunately perceived by the patient as a negative one. A positive aspect, so we can each turn that dialogue along and around in some some case in the context of our dialogue within treatment, or as a consequence of pre and post treatment as well. Okay, so again, we have this fourth idea that you know the result of correction of lesion when the principles of correction have been applied in any of all of these fields above, the fluids and forces of the body are liberated from the pressure of irritation, and consequently, as a we go back again. We go back again. And consequence of that, you know, we have those, those, those dynamics of um, fluids within the, the, the body that can provide a nutritional component to things, whether it's you know, vascularization to the spinal cord, providing you know, segmental functionality, potential for that, restoration through to venous drainage, through to the lymphatics, the essential functionality of the lymphatics, uh, venous return. And of course, you know, what is happening in, in, in the domain of the intracellular and extracellular components in terms of the matrix, cellular so matrix and tissues too. So that's you know, not just purely dealing with just the simplicity of moving tissues in relation to shift to vessels, but in terms of the actual dynamics of you know, um, blood components and, and cellular components being 
exchanged from one region of the body to the other as efficiently as possible. Taking into account, of course, you know, the consequences of prolonged gravity effects and the consequences of changes in the parameters of the thoracic abdominal pelvic relationships and how those you know, fascial relationships might be influencing that in terms of compartmentalization of various things too, in terms of the cavity dynamics of the body. So let's go on a little bit. Let's discuss um, one of the uh, funny things um, that I want to talk about, our first kind of dilemma that we come across, something that I come across every day. Where do we start? Where do we begin? Well, we're lucky in some respects because that the, the contents of the body adjustment gives that, that kind of like rationale um, that provides a routine of um, uh, treatment that approach that deals with you know total body screening in the context of addressing what we find in the, the nature of movement, but also at the same time you know um, clarifying what we're seeing in terms of our active passive observations of the patient tests that we might have done, and of course, you know, significant screen procedures and protocols that we use uh, prior to treatment tests. And, and, you know, our differential ideas in relationship to that too. So within the context of the body adjustment, you know, we're not actually dealing with this concept of really chicken and egg, but, you know, it can become a complex scenario. So let's just quickly look at that for fun or just out of interest as part one of the respective dilemmas that we might have. So here we are. This is it, you know, one of the classic examples that we have, um, if you look on the right hand side there, you'll see the, the skeletal structure of the chicken and skeletal, the, the structure of the, of, the, of the egg. Yeah, it's representational, you know, what do we begin with? Do we begin with the chicken or the egg? Do we begin with, you know, looking at that primary focus of disturbance? Or do we look at, you know, the dynamic of integration, integration of various components of, uh, of disturbances? Or, scenarios that we might see. So again, this is a classic example, you know, there's a lot of analysis that can be brought across, but as soon as we get too deep into analysis, it becomes overwhelming. And if you look at that simple diagram with the pelvis in the middle, that really gives a nice indication to show us that, you know, this dynamic of pelvic functionality in terms of potential for sacral dysfunction and the act dysfunction is, you know, glo really a global thing and, and you can't really always pinpoint it down to a specific lesion pattern. And the consequences of these disturbances can be quite profound and there can be superimposition uh, and there can be also scenarios where uh, what we see or what we feel is not necessarily what's going on with our fingers when we actually look at, you know, various CT scans or MRI scans or, or, or various uh, and things that indicate other consequences of our, our analysis. So let's have a look at this. You know, the one thing we're not going to be doing is really kind of like looking at trying to hunt a lesion. You know, we're not specifically looking at trying to find lesions. We're trying to see what the consequences of those lesions are. Where, where are they within the context of the patient in terms of the production of you know, septic stimulus or pain through to the changes in the dynamics of function or in terms of the movement in terms of relation for example or in terms of you know the nature of the cognitive function of the patient or the ability to you know to do certain tasks or activities as well and that goes on and extends into the visceral field not just purely the structural field as well so i'm going a little bit quick but there's a lot of slides to produce a lot of slides to go through next thing we're going to look at is effectively you know the essentials that we relate to in terms of the um, the aspects of our, the patient. And I'm going to go through this in terms of the, you know, one of the aspects of our application or context of our work within that routine of utilizing the body adjustment and look at the base of the, of the, of the pelvis as a, one of our contributing factors and then looking at the consequences of that base uh, and the consequences of the influence that has on the, the pelvic ring has on the lumbar spine and then going on to continue other areas to in relationship to the thoracic spine survivals and other things too. So let's have a look at that. One of the things that we constantly are addressing is the relationship of, you know, how far does an actual joint move? What range do we have? What are our indications that we find in terms of dynamics of movement that we're going to begin to assess? So this is one thing that's nice about the context of, again, the way we approach, we approach the 
natural long lever and focal application within the context of our treatment regime of the body adjustment is that we try to maintain the stay within physiological parameters. Once in a while we'll go towards that barrier restriction and you know, try to identify the nature of that barrier, maybe ease and teeth towards that, that barrier dynamic so that we can improve the potential range of movement and actual uh, um, freedom, potential joint freedom, if needed, for that particular structure. So let's have a look at these. Um, you can see here that we have that typical scenario where we have you know, the gray zone between the N and P in terms of side bending, uh, sorry, the rotation side bending or flexion extension, being that physiological barrier. And then we have the actual anatomical barrier that we have to respect. We don't want to push too hard. We don't want to put any dynamic force that's too, too strong because, you know, we don't know what the nature of those osseous tissues are under our hands. We can have an idea relating to the, the dynamic, the, 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 the age group of the patient, but, you know, there might be demineralization, there might be an underlying pathology. So we stay within the confines um, of, you know, that dynamic of movement. Um, you know, of course, to related to pathologies, you know, screening procedures that we might use, and we might, you know, defer further treatment based on the nature of our, our, our findings within that, the dynamic of movement and the okay, eliciting analysis we can do to discover what's going on. But what I wanted to look at again is this whole idea behind, you know, this dynamic of movement and assessment is we're looking into, you know, what are the consequences of potential disturbances in facet, facet plane movement, intraosseous ligamentous structures, and of course, intercapsular structures of the facets themselves, and but most importantly as well, the dynamics of the disc, you know, something that is you know, significant throughout the spinal column itself. So again, when we look at this, and we look at this dynamic here, we're looking at, you know, what is that passive segment motion finding? What are we looking at? How are we addressing it when we're providing a little bit of rotation, extension side bending? You know, what are the components that we're beginning to address? Is there a restriction in one or two or three components that might indicate, you know, the, the function of the, the dynamic of that potential presenting lesion we we'll talk about? And again, you know, the one in the middle is this type one lesion pattern that we see. Um, typically presenting um, um, a change in the dynamics of superior and inferior vertebra and their relationship to the, the facet and, and, and vertebral disc relationship, which we'll talk about in a minute. So again, you know, let's have a look. You know, there are many, many parameters that we have to consider, um, and uh, these are all you know available on the resource that I've given you. There's some information on that web link. There's um, various uh, PDFs that are based on, you know, um, standardized uh, standardization of these observations that we find. It. You can look on that on the internet, or you can pick it up off the webs. So that's what I've included on the link. But again, you know, we are looking at addressing the, the dynamics of the pelvis as a pelvis as a girdle, as a ring, not just purely in isolation. You know, we have to relate to the consequences of these respective in flare, out flare, and relationships with the anomalous the associated change in the actual acetabulum levels or the actual functionality of the hip in relationship to the, um, the, the muscle groups that are insert and, and ligaments, in particular ligament structures that are dealing with we're dealing with. Yeah. So, you know, this is nothing new, but, you know, it's just a review that gives us that kind of like visual context. So when we're next dealing with our patient, we're not just purely looking at, you know, that dynamic of, uh, you know, that particular solvers or that particular presenting uh, uh, dynamic of a shift, but you know, that whole um, dynamic of movement and the consequence and the effect of that uh, within, within, within that, within that parameter in relation to the lower extremity and of course the system of the actual vertical column above it. So again, it's not rocket science, but it's actually you know, dealing with the uh, obvious indications that we might have be looking for and, and addressing. And that's the nice thing again, going back, not to overwhelm you with the context of the body adjustment, but you know, this is the nice thing about the dynamic within the lever fulcrum aspect of that. We begin to assess those functional insertions from the hip as we circumduct the, the, the leg. As we begin to adduct, abduct the leg, we begin to you know, deal with those you know, inferior, superior, medial, lateral, all the muscular insertions into those structures. And again, we're also addressing you know, the integrity, which is very much dependent on those interruptions, 
ligaments too. So we have these specific flexion tests that we can have, sitting tests um, that relate to uh, various components, either addressing the primary sacral movement where we disengage the leg functionality, or you know, the separate iliac functionality relationship with the patient standard in the forwards. So you know, these give certain parameters and certain indications. You know, that, that they can be kind of like a bit confusing because of this, these sort of these kind of like general patterns that we, we, we have in mind aren't always necessarily there, or they can be you know, not what we find. So there can be these indications of uh, certain scenarios where the, the structures become blocked or fixed or superimposed when there has been you know, trauma or mechanical uh, uh, loading on, on the joint itself. Okay, let's go on. We've got the pubic structures we have to deal with. That's also a relationship that we also work to. Again, so conduction of the, of the hip in relationship to the, the ductal muscle groups enables, uh, gives us an, an ability to assess that in terms of the functional dynamic. But also, you know, we can deal with that in terms of our palpital findings, in terms of the, the pubic brain line, etc., if needed. So again, going back, you know, where is all of this coming to? Where is this leading to? Basically, you know, the influence on muscle groups, in ligaments, etc., um, on the pelvis can be quite uh, profound. And we can't necessarily always assume that there's just purely a simple kind of like shift or slip or, or torsion. There can be a, you know, a dynamic which involves more than one component of that. And if you look at the uh, illustration on the, on the right, we have the you know, number of ligaments that have a profound effect on muscle groups. Also, the and the lateral muscle groups, for example, and born quadratus, but lumbar, for example, all have an influence, including the ventral muscle groups, including the cervix as well. So, you know, this is one thing I put up on uh, Facebook um, a few weeks ago. I had a patient presenting to me here um, and was given, you know, core stability exercises um, to try and promote the, 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 the strengthening of, of, of the back. But unfortunately, you know, the actual interosseous ligamentals uh, structures go, were, weren't able to deal with that. So, you know, I, I, I just produced this little illustration and sent them to them to just explain why, you know, why aren't you, and um, why isn't it perhaps not advisable at this stage, at this stage, to encourage uh, you know, abdominal and muscle activities and its core stability kind of concept um, to the patient. It was too, too early. And that wasn't prescribed by me described by someone else. Um, but as you can see, you know, the dynamics of the, of the pelvis are, are not purely just localized. It's, you know, that's the whole concept within the leg rotations that we're doing. We can apply, you know, various leverages, fulcrums to you know, assess the nature of that. But also, you know, what are those actual extrinsic, extrinsic muscle groups? And, you know, the significance of those too. So again, going on from there, you know, we have to break down these various components of the pelvis into the the various planes, and there are quite a few of them. We have quite a you know, variety of them, we have specific ones that we can relate to, but at the same time, we mustn't ignore the fact that you know, these planes can also be you know, even more oblique or even more uh, uh, lateral, if, if, according to the, the nature of the, uh, of the potential leverage or the influence of the leverages upon the sacrum, and also you know, the consequences of potential shearing or torsional patterns, and a bit of com a combination of both. This is why we utilize, for example, the Chicago technique, to, um, which is you know, a method for addressing you know, the sacrum primarily to influence the, the adaptive functionality of the number of five on the sacrum, but at the same time might deal with you know, a company unilateral ileal dysfunction at the same time too. So these are the specific um, um, components of, of adjustments, the types of adjustments have a specific role and a specific effect. So again, you know, this is one thing that always gets me, you know, when a patient comes to you or, you know, in, in that classic scenario, and then you look at the text and the and material that supports what we're doing, there is a multitude of various parameters that we present to you. And it can be very overwhelming. And you can go through this systematically if you want to. Um, within, you know, the context of my work, I will look for specific sulfur patterns. I will look for specific dynamic patterns in terms of, you know, st stressing various normal ligaments anterior, posterior, and maybe you know, superior and inferiorly. But you know, within the context of you know local and examination functional assessment, but also you know quite often within the context of my liver fulcrum, 
supine and prone dynamic body adjustment. So, phew, how many are there and how many can you recall and how many can you really, really feel? That is, you know, that's, the, that's, that's my kind of like additional dilemma that we come across. And, you know, some of you might be quite proficient at these things, but, you know, within the dynamic of treatment, you know, we're ultimately trying to provide that easy, normal, neutral relationship with the pelvis relationship to the numbers, trying to reestablish that functionality of the central gravity line and in the functionality of posture and loading uniform through that pelvic structure in relation to the numbers and then the body above and of course the dynamic re reflex activity in that in the functionality of the hip, knee and ankle and foot below. So we don't again just deal with one region of isolation. Okay, so you know this is one aspect, you know, these components have a specific effect. There are specific solvencies that present to ourselves and there are specific adaptive um, um, conditions or you know, um, compensatory patterns dealing with the functionality of L5. And of course, that consequently relates to the functionality of L4, L3, and that relates to the whole spinal column above. So we can have these kind of like quite profound presentations. And within the context of our treatment, you know, we can start to address those within the lever fulcrum application of the leg on ilium on actual L4, L5. And this is the nice subtle thing about the body adjustment approach. It kind of like starts to address one of these or component of these representing um, kind of uh, presentations or modified dynamic, I don't want to say Asia too much because it's you know, multi, multi faceted, it's multi dynamic in its presentation a lot of the time. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't present without some degree of modification of an AP a natural presentation of the spinal group curve and, and corresponding vertebra above and you know, corresponding adaptive hip and knee and foot dynamics below. So here we go. That's one slide I should have put in. Let's have a look. This is what we're definitely you know quite often finding there is um, a lot of information that we relate to uh, in terms of our examination of the patient. Why does someone for example it's got this typical you know, anterior right oblique um, axis influence on the sacrum relation to the ilia. Begin to bring the knee forwards to try to drop down that, that higher hip on the right hand side to try and re establish that baseline, you know, the, and, you know try to re establish you know, the relationship of the, of the thoracic number and cervical and suboccipital you know, structures above. So, you know, the body is constantly, you know, dyna dynamically trying to establish a state of equilibrium in terms of posture and pelvic cavity dynamics, thoracic dynamics, but also, you know, that horizontal line of the vestibular apparatus. Um, and, you know, that whole idea of trying to establish um, the reducing the effect of prolonged gravity and loading the body in its receptive structures. So again, you know, this is nothing new, but within the context of our treatment, we're dealing with that baseline, we're dealing with that leg rotations on the right-hand side, dealing with engaging the sulcus uh, at various points for, um, in terms of our fulcrum point, inferiorly, and maybe on the right, and superiorly, maybe on the left, and also addressing the nature of that L5 dynamic in terms of its kind of side bending rotation, trying to restore that central gravity as we try, that the body tries desperately to posture and another explanation too. So, you know, what are we doing? How can we deal with that? Well, you know, here is me with a um, whole variety of uh, modalities or approaches using the, the concept of long lever in terms of uh, long lever on fulcrum, dealing with that whole general aspect of using the lower extremity to address the, the lumbar spine in terms of flexion, extension, side bending, rotation, engaging in terms of providing a bit of classic, um, classic gapping, flexion extension again, and again, of course, providing torsion rotation. None of this is new, um, and of course, you know, this, this is um, something that we're dealing with in terms of uh, not just purely addressing the, the, uh, the muscle groups associated with the insertions of the on the pelvis, but also dealing with that, you know, myofascial relationship with two, as two as we stretch through the uh, down the spine, and maybe include our application of, of our thinner eminence or fingers to encourage counter bending, side bending um, of the respective uh, thoracic uh, lumbar group or thoracic group presenting to us from the thoracic, you can also see on that bar, 
um, diagram on the, on the right hand side and on the bottom. You know, the whole dynamic of rotation can be extended up into the DL, and the adjustment can be you know, also encoded within the, that region too, but also stretching in E's and T's of, you know, of, the, of the number of group. So that we can provide an environment for the tissues to respond without the need of actually providing two um, short levered or dynamic you know, velocity related application to our adjustment. Okay, again, you know, various components within the context of the treatment. Again, you know, numbers, again, sidewall positioning, we can have them sitting, we can have a gentle position where we're encouraging you know, flexion extension, side body rotation as they're sitting, going further to, you know, the, pro the aspect of actually having two operator modalities where we can actually deal with decompressing the thoracic lumbar area and actually deal very, very efficiently in relationship to that thoracic lumbar fascial relationships as well. Um, and we can also, you know, maybe address, you know, the, uh, the necessity of applying a two-operator approach where there is specific fixation. This approach is very focused, it's very local, but it is also very, um, very, very subtle in this approach. And, and again, utilizing that long lever ensures that we have control um, without the need of providing too much force. So the leverage is providing the force at a specific um, uh, dynamic of, of fulcrum without the need of providing the pressure and pushing through uh, into that barrier zone too much. And again, you know, as we see the woman illustrating here, there are various other methods of addressing the sacrum relationship to its presentation. So disengaging the ilium relationships and focusing purely on engaging that sacroiliac, uh, that iliosacrum, that sacrum, sacrum relationship to the ilium using the knee of the body, can decide then rotation, flexion, extension, depending on the nature of that uh, presenting scenario, and providing that potential for a long release without, again, too much. Um, degree of force. Also, if you look at the far right, you'll see the modification so that the actual approach can be dealing with the upper dorsal, uh, sorry, upper lumbar and dorsal lumbar junction. So none of this is new, but again, this, I just wanted to emphasize that when we're dealing with lesions, you know, the idea of integrating the lever and fulcrum and the integration of structures is very vital and important to our, our work and the basis of our work. So again, we're not neglecting, here we see John Wernham again using that the lovely double hold of the sacroiliac, applying this kind of like coarptition movement, that dynamic of adjusting that raft, encouraging an ilium release in relation to the left ilium uh, dynamic as well. Um, again, you know, his focus is on that, you know, respective pattern that we might have there, but also the consideration of how that iliosoas functionality is, imp is influencing the potential of the, of the, the, the tilting of the, of the pelvis and how we might provide counter side bending and rotation or side bending at the moment of, of circumduction to start to engage or disengage the service relationship. And of course, as you see on the right hand side, you see him begin to actually engage that upper thoracic, so upper lumbar, thoracic lumbar region to try and provide, you know, the, the, the counter rotational side bending flexion extension that might be needed as a consequence of um, the insertion points of the uh, psoas in the period to the diaphragm. So, you know, and the floating ribs, of course. So, you know, these lever fulcrum applications are very vital. And within the context of the supine, we're quite often dealing with flexion scenario, flexion components of the body, again, prone, we're dealing with the extension components. So, you know, and sideline, we're dealing with the long components, which is very valuable too. Okay, so we've gone through some aspects of it. Let's have a look at the actual, you know, ideas behind physiological lesioning, the components of fires, and looking at, you know, the components that uh, you're familiar with. The uh, diagrams on the left are quite nice because they give that kind of, like, you know, nice global interpretation of what we're looking for in terms of the presentation of the sacrum in relationship to the, uh, the corresponding um, on the, on the spine. And, you know, do the groups move? Um, together in a group, or is there some indication of a particular vertebra, you know, pointing out at us, finding that in the indication of the type one uh, representation that we have in the middle diagram, the type two where there is a natural curve. So again, we have this ERS scenario, FSR scenario as the you know, coupling movement or the compound movement of the movement 
movement within the lumbar spine. Again, side bending, not too much, about 10 degrees. So again, you know, the integrity of that whole structure is dependent upon a very rigid structure because, you know, it's maintaining the load of the body above and dealing with the dynamic of the pelvis and the legs below it. So, you know, there's this typical scenario where we have a division also within the thoracics, the first nine vertebra and the 10th, 11th and 12th being, you know, kind of like pseudo, you know, transitional between uh, the range of the thoracic functionality to lumbar. So again, you know, we have to deal with that and, you know, that represents to itself uh, in our biomechanical model um, as the internuncial point in you know, that transition zone where the floating ribs are quite often a point of buckling or compression or, you know, distortion that we can deal with within the context of treatment too. So I'm zipping through all of this because it's stuff that you're familiar with, but you know, there is this kind of scenario that we're dealing with either a neutral, neutral position or an easy idling position of the spine, whereas you know, induction of movement and side bending and rotation incurs a certain direction of movement and rotation of the body of the vertebra to the opposite side. So we get that typical kind of like unique singular representation within that curve natural curve and then the others for example when we get the type two we get this coupling mechanism where it involves you know a you know beyond the, the neutral the neutral zone of that physiological neutral zone type one you know, first engagement of flexion or extension where the facets are either engaged or the inter interarticular structures of the facet capsules are engaged and flexing or extension extending and you know can in you know, the consequent side bending rotation when it's induced works in a group goes in a group. So often we see this scenario where type two is thought to have due to maybe maybe uh, as a consequence of the trauma scenario not always and the type one you know as a consequence of just pure rotation uh, within the dynamic of the leading neutral plane. So you know type one couple pattern we see one there type two spinal couple pattern there, you know, the presentation to our fingers in terms of the spine's processes in relationship to the transverse process superiorly and inferiorly given in, gives us an indication of, you know, either a curve group or a break in that particular group, natural curve. It's indicating type one, type two presentation. So again, you know, within the context of our leg levers, within the context of our supine work, and especially on the left, when we're dealing with counter side bending rotation of numbers, on that lumbar sacral junction. We're also doing, you know, putting our fingers further up into that dorsal lumbar region to assess how that is related to that potential natural presentation. And, you know, most importantly, the significance of the fourth and fifth, sorry, the third and fourth vertebra in terms of that function of that third lumbar in terms of central gravity. So a lot of this stuff might be new to you, it might not be new to you, but, you know, you know when we analyze the different parameters within that, that routine, they're there for a reason. They're there to encourage this counter rotation sign bending tendency, body extension of flexion within the parameters of the leg, and with our hands as a full group of that too. So we're encouraging that ease and tease towards you know the adjustment tendencies. You know. So we don't have to specifically use too much force in the dynamic adjustment later. So again, you know, these are the typical uh, presenting scenarios that we have. Um, it's the third principle, of course, that we have where any plane of movement creates or motion will involve another plane as well. So no two planes are ever in isolation in terms of parameters of vertical movement. Okay, so looking at the right hand side, this is a classical one, type one neutral, type two non-neutral, you know, the typical presentations that we have, lateral curve, flat AP curve in the, in, in the type two, FSR presentation, ESR presentation. So, you know, we're looking at that AP profile and that lateral profile of the curves and the curves within the dynamic of the, the regional dynamics of the spine to give an indication of what's going on. And of course, that will be exemplified when we ask the patient to bend forwards, or when we ask the patient to side bend, and then we can actually specifically see more of an indication of these respective type of coupling, fixation, as you might call them, in the sense of that region for presentation. So again, nothing new, but you know, we use the parameters of uh, our legal fulcrum to assess and start to address these uh, vision patterns. So there are many ways in which we can address, you know, the, the at, you know, the, not just purely the, 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 the central axial components of the spine, but also, you know, the natural relationship of the 
attachments of the ribs and you know the respective lateral muscle groups and fascial attachments as well my professional relationships with that as well you know as a unity as a you know as an integration of component to our treatment that's purely working in isolation again and again as you see these a lot of people have seen these already beautiful indications of just pure simple lever on fulcrum with our focus applying either localized finger or palm application to a, a localized or broad application or even a kind of like in some cases we can have a situation where we're, we're providing a, a bridging component to the, the nature of the application of the, of the fulcrum uh, so that you know the fulcrum relationship with lever so we can actually provide for example you know bracing in, in a hypermobile area and actually encourage you know the uh, the hypomobile relationships of the spine above or below or the capsule structure you know there might be ligament flexity we will we'll brace the finger but provide you know that freedom of movement with the, uh, within the accessory muscles that are a component of the girdle so you know all these components are very relevant to what we're doing so again we're looking at this you know there's not just purely this whole component which is simple lesion components or simple coupling movements but these coupling movements can become you know dramatically influenced as you see by those images above you know typical bicycle motorbike accident sudden you know dynamic change of parameters of lever through the arms or through the body classic scenarios also when you're doing weight the weight training environment where someone's overloading the shoulders trying to do a, a you know, pull where they're putting the, the, the bar behind their neck dropping their heads forwards maybe relaxing the one hand because the weight is too much other arms creating the side and natural rotation with torsion bingo you know we're getting this lifting effect first of all of this you know relationship with the facet to the tripod uh, relationship to the vertebral body and then we're getting this extreme extension rotation side bending and then this sudden reacting kind of like locking or spasm as a consequence of this faulty uh, of this poly faulty uh, pro, um, uh, tripod mechanism so again, you know, we have this wonderful little image that was, I believe, in the Fundamentals book by John, John Martin, by John Wernham uh, and Melvin Morgan, or maybe it was in the, the, the uh, technique books. Um, of this, you know, the nature of this kind of like lesion that we get. So we have these physiological lesions that we represent as normal patterns, and then we have these unphysiological ones, which are, you know, components where there's extreme movements quite often. And you know, we talk about this kind of like first degree and second degree lesion like rather than primary and secondary lesions um, to explain this mechanical fact. So let's just zoom up on one of those. And you can see that you know the first degree is usually kind of like you know almost where the articulation when it's examined is held in a state of side bending and rotation, the same side of bending, the second more, because remember it's going with the group. There, these were the most easily reduced categories because we can kind of like you know, reverse that by providing traction, side so bending and rotation if we needed to. And you see there that you find that typical presentation of TP in relation to the SP, in relationship to that lateral side bending that we see in that diagram. You'll have these notes, they're, they're available to you. And of course, the second degree is when we actually have that breakdown in that pure tripod mechanism where at some stage there's been a primary kind of like movement with a compensatory adaptive or some kind of extreme hyperextension and flexion rotation, and the actual tripod, the actual facet itself, has become um, kind of become uh, dislodged or unstable, and actually begins to collapse. And we see this typical presentation of the spinous process locked and overlapping the inferior one on the relationship to the superior one. So that's typically the presentation that we typically look for when the second degree is presented to itself. And again, how are we dealing with this? Well, look at this. This is amazing. You know, this is the kind of stuff that some practitioners might engage in. I've only done this kind of approach once when I did have a patient that presented to me with a mountain bike injury, actually, when they were on the handlebars and they fell over the handlebars and turning their head to talk to a friend at the time, hit a log or something and then smack torsional rotation. And the, the address that I gave was basically working with within that to freeing up that into, into a thoracic spasm and reactive contractility of that injury point to a point where I can actually provide effectively almost a lift-off effect. And when you look at these 
procedures here broken down, you can see how complex it becomes because you're not just purely working with the actual rib, so the vertebrae, you're actually dealing with the consequence of the rib disturbance as well. So these notes are with you. Again, you know, we're dealing with that, that, that um, schematic from left to right, providing a means of providing, first of all, disengagement of, the, of those, those facets that are under locked, lifting up, providing counter, counter rotation, and then engaging on the other side to provide counter side bending and rotation and in di disengagement. So we're actually providing two components on, on, on top of each other. You know, we're dealing with that collapse, dealing with the collapse, bringing it back to that normal position where it's the first, the first type of representation to us, and then engaging, uh, disengaging the, the, the IV facets. So with, with bringing flexion in, so the actual, there's enough space for the, the facets to move and to be being brought into counter rotation, side bending, restoring, restoring that tripod relationship. And those kind of like um, adjustments are quite complex and not easy to achieve in, uh, straight away. And quite frequently, you have to work in relationship to the power of vertical muscle groups, periscopic muscle groups, providing flexion extension to try and take out that, you know, that guarding, that physiological locking that is associated with that type of lesion pattern that we see. So again, you know, we also have the idea that, you know, there are an exaggeration of these components where, you know, basically the body is constantly trying to adapt to a shift in gravity, to trying to bring itself back to the midline. So when we have the first degree, it's thrown out of the midline, it brings itself back, Quite often there is a compensatory extension of flexion, which begins to bring it back to the second degree component into the spine, providing a, a locking mechanism. And quite often over time, as a consequence of the body adapting to that and loading, that becomes developing, developing into the third degree, where again there's kind of, kind of like a hyperphysiological and mechanical reaction and loading and, and, and locking that kind of like creates that third degree component. So you know, these kind of presentations are very very difficult to address because they're non-physiological. You, you address them, you think, well, moment, that curve doesn't go as it should do. Those spinal processes and the vertical orders aren't moving as they should be. And there's quite a lot of rigidity, quite a lot of an extension and flexion component to that lower um, lumbar spine, and quite often you see the adaptive representation in the D11, D11, 12D, and of course, you know, that relationship with that central arch, which is supported from D5, through to 11, which is, you know, you know, it influences the dynamic of that primary embryonic curve mm -hmm. after a while. So hopefully I'm, you know, bringing this information into the context of applied physiology, neurophysiology, well, no, applied, you know, biomechanics, and, and bringing it into, within the context of our, our treatment domain. So again, you know, I'm only going to look at the C's shortly because it's always a, uh, an area of, of, of complexity because you know we have this upper coupling mechanism with the occiput uh, on C1 on C2, um, and of course you know that is kind of like also dealing with the reciprocal functionality going on below in the LS relationship as well, and that of course continues on into the actual cranium in terms of torsion patterns that potentially can arise there too, and the being maintained perhaps. So you know what have we got in terms of principles of physiological motion? It's you know the law of opposites, it's opposites to what we see in the thoracic and lumbar. We get this side bending rotation to the same direction, so that makes it you know relatively you know easy to assess in terms of the fact that we will have a group um, that will go towards the side bending rotation with a degree of fixation at a level of restriction. So there will be a degree of lateral side bending or uh, lateral flip that that can be uh, perceived in terms of our uh, um, that's a simple transitional movement of the vertebra. And then we're actually dealing with, you know, what component of extension or flexion we have to take out to um, res res resolve that kind of component. So again, this is quite often, again, where we start dealing with the push and pull dynamic of the adjustment that we see. So the atypical vertebra C1 and C2, of course, because, you know, there's a lot going on in that area. And that's also something we have to deal with too. Where, you know, we have this ERS scenario going on, but then you know the whole mechanism of the uh, just capital muscles influencing the, the OAA complex, and of course the potential for the, uh, the, head, the head to become locked and jammed in that relationship. So that's you know a review, a quick review 
not going too much into detail, but just reviewing, you know, that side of things. And that always have this, this for me, and for a lot of people I think is, you know, where do we start with all of this? Well, you know, we are dealing with finding maybe that representational baseline presentation and the consequences of that. You know, we can go back to the analogy of building foundations being good, then the building begins to, you know, take, become stabilized. As soon as the foundation changes, the rest of the actual building can accommodate. And that will go through up into the sub and beyond, including the, um, perhaps even the uh, tutorial membranes in the, in the brain too. That's interesting. Okay, so um, those people with a QR code reader on their phones, if you zap that now, it should lead you to um, the next stage uh, of the lecture or the actual new type of, um, of uh, presentation. I'm just going to see whether you want to work me or not. It probably doesn't because you guys are slightly Anyway, it should theoretically go to the, uh, the website with all the documentation, including the presentation there. So we're going to look at the um, Asian concepts and origins. So this is um, looking at a little bit of history where the actual uh, concept of the ideas of the Asian, Asian comes from. Um, ooh, we're going a little bit into time, aren't we, here? But uh, oh, how are we doing, um, Diego? Can we run over a little bit? Or, yeah, we are going yeah, back. Yeah, because although we were at schedule an hour, we did run a bit, start a bit late, and there's a lot of interesting information out there now coming to us. So all this information is there for you to, to look at on that link. Um, and, um, you know, the documents are there to download. Please respect the fact that the they are the property of respective authors. It's for reference point, reference only. Um, but at the same time, you know, they are, are open to your access through your respective the regulatory bodies and uh, provide you with that uh, pathway for research articles. Okay, so one of the things that um, we're going to look at is um, uh, uh, an article by uh, Torsten Liam, um, and he uh, present, presented this nice little article, which is on part of the resources, and talks about the actual, you know, the history behind some aspects of uh, the concepts and origins of, of, of the Socratic region. Now, a lot of the time, um, this doesn't include everybody. It doesn't include, um, for example, uh, Hulot. It doesn't. Sorry, it doesn't include, for example, um, Louise Burns and other, you know, contributing people. Um, but you know, it, it relates to various kind of like concepts in terms of definitions of uh, of the region. So the first one we're talking going to be talking about is uh, Hulot's. Um, and Dudley Hulot's ideas, um, and he was one of the first people to document the Socratic region as a kind of structural perversion or, uh, with, which may produce or maintain functional disorders. So um, it only refer, not only refers to bony anomalies or bony lesions, but also, also to you know, the surrounding tissues, muscle ligaments, etc. Uh, differentiating three types into basically those that relate to bones, joints, and organs. So there, if you see table one, that gives an illustration of that. Dislocation and subluxation may refer to bony tissues, making distinction between complete dislocation and incomplete subluxation. So, you know, that kind of like overlap in chiropractic terminology comes in there a little bit. Separation of the joint surfaces, displacement referred to, to flexible structures such as organs, prolapse, which is example, for example. So, it goes beyond the domain of the kind of like osseous lesion. So he used the term spinal lesion not to define diseases or malformations of the vertebrae, instead to describe mostly unobtrusive subluxation. So he's looking at moderate degrees of, of change in the parameters of movement, the dynamic profile of the actual vertebrae. And usually in conjunction with, of course, we do the muscle statements, bones, etc. And how that may be relating to the consequence of etiological of disease. So again, under, under that uh, table there, dislocation. Subluxation, displacement, tissue involved, bone, tissue, um, organs, etc. Going on from there, we have um, Cole in 1935, comes up with another category, um, defines osteoporotic lesion as a restriction of spinal joint movement and, and can be resolved. Um, I'm just going to actually pull up my own lecture material, this becomes obviously all the images that you guys have got. So that is, I'm going to which is here, which you guys have also got as well, I believe. 
Okay. So we're basically looking at these. Um, goes back. We're looking at the different nature of the, of the lesion being that of traumatic, um, so caused by giant trauma. Uh, reflecting uh, associated spinal cord centers, so certain segmental um, involvement there. Non-physiological articulation affected joint surfaces in rest resting phase or by disturbed intra-articular tension. All these lesions, regardless of their cause at the time of origin, are responsible for causing the same diseases. So, you know, there's this kind of like idea that the lesion pattern is presenting you know, potential causality of disease or sort of dysfunction. And then after deformity or position of the spine and ribs will directly affect the vital channels, i.e. free fluids or arteries, veins, lymphatic vessels, etc. So, you know, there's that kind of like dynamic from changing that concept of being purely osseous into that kind of like physiological realm of domain. And we have Castillo in 1930, developed upon his definition of the spinal lesion. And, of course, he looked at the spinal lesion uh, of one of several joint facets being involved so you know looking at that dynamic structure and how we are actually begin to address the palpatory uh, soft tissue presentations um, dealing with the uh, consequence effects of that so according to Castillo and also about these affected nerves that innervate the organ may impair the organs as well as overall health of organism and that's predisposed to disease now this is not you know excluding other contributing factors you know um, we have got um, other other people that are thinking this with the, these dynamic dynamics at the same time, um, and we're looking at the consequence of you know the effects of effective stasis and ingestion and ischemia and etc. going on and creating the long term effects and also the inflammatory responses occurring within the context of that region. So then we get that first idea of you know. Complex lesion, lesion complex. So Harrison Downing, MD, used the term greater osteopathic lesion complex to describe adaptive consequences of the nervous system, circulatory system, secretory motor system, secretory system, excretory system, in terms of that you know, consequences of the, the established lesion. Greater osteopathic lesion complex includes impairments of normal spinal joint mobility, anatomical limits, and also you know that you know consequent effect of uh, Relationship of dynamics of the actual parameters of uh, spinal movement and in terms of curve dynamics, in terms of presentation of uh, things, and you know, looks into the consequences of uh, trauma as well. So, you know, the whole idea is that you know, this localized effect has a also a distal effect, too. So, again, you know, ah, I didn't include it. Ah, sorry, everybody, I will update this. There is a beautiful drawing that um, I forgot to put in called um, the Little John Equation. And it talks about the whole idea of uh, this whole concept where Little John starts to look further than just purely the osseous um, and neurophysiological concept, but actual holistic uh, component of, of, of the body and homeostasis. And begins to look at that whole idea of how. You know, disease processes are not just purely mediated through the local spinal field, but you know, are expressed in terms of that change in the, in the body's mechanism of assimilation versus elimination. So as soon as we get the elimination buildup, we have toxicity that compromises the ability for assimilation, digestion, nutrition, and that breaks down into a potential toxic state of the body to develop. So um, last week or two weeks ago, I was with some colleagues in Italy and we were talking about that whole uh, mechanism of the liver and how that process is very, very dependent on nutrients that we, can, we assimilate. And of course, as soon as we have that, that constipation or dynamic, uh, where we can see the elimination process is compromised, you know, the body can't assimilate the nutrients so well through the portal circulation and the liver becomes full of you know, changes in the dynamics of the system. Too, um, and of course the toxic buildup begins there too to some degree. Um, but of course you have a process of busy with the toxification process. So that's why you know we get that scenario of the skin and the lungs and, and, and the kidneys, etc. 
and based on the membranes of the body begin to try to eliminate the toxic field or the, the changes in the extracellular and intracellular relationships of these tissues um, on a certain membrane basis as well. So again, structural lesion dependent was uh, an expanding the thoughts of, of Becker, Harris and Fry looking at these ideas of uh, respective uh, mechanical compensation patterns and you know how it relates and Lovett was also involved with this um, to dealing with that whole physiological notion in terms of breaking down the, the components of the coupling as we just recently described and how those particular mechanical influences predispose to the onset of modality disease in terms of pelvic abdominal cavity dynamics but also the neurophysiological ex extension of that too. Okay, so we have McDonnell and Wilson classified the lesions according to the primary and secondary lesion types that we call today. The primary lesion is a lesion of joint caused by acute torsion, and the secondary being adapted or as a consequence of other influential parameters as well. Secondary lesions were caused by means of reflex arc or by irritation of the spinal segment, visceral somatic, and the bicycle is somatic visceral reflex. So again, we relate to that to some degree in terms of the assessment of the, 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 the lesion dynamic. Again, we have now in the 1960s, there is a change from the lesion to a uh, different uh, dynamical, different category, different uh, definition. And we have the Education Council of Australian Principles defining, redefining the lesion as a systematic function. So impaired or altered function related components of somatic body framework, sleeval or fluid and myofascial, and related vascular lymphatic and neural elements. Somatic dysfunction is a treatable, is treatable using osteopathy. Manipulative treatment, manipulative treatment being one of the components of what we're doing. Okay, so again, that delves with the realm of the high, whole idea of you know, the identification of the nature of the lesion and how that particular influence of the lesion has an effect on the nervous functionality. And you know, that's reflected through the respect to the neurotrophic findings that we had in terms of the nature of the, uh, the, the nutritional component of the, of the nerve and also the, as we know today, the axonal isotransmic uh, flow to and from the dendritical structures and the neuron itself, the nucleus of the neuron itself. So, you know, if we look at this uh, illustration on the right, it's a typical kind of like relate. Um, schematic that we relate to in terms of representing uh, uh, tissue presentations and dynamic of vertebral relation to the acute onset of a, of a disturbance with relationship to the, the, the spine and the tissue field in relationship to the chronic and the expression of that in terms of the dynamics of the etc. Oh, does this mean we've got a lot of other people leaving lots of questions for me? Oh, okay. So again, we have a call. We have him representing that next stage of neurophysiological research and the whole idea that we have this facilitation uh, component and how there's changes in thresholds of specific uh, neurons that influence the dynamic of tissue and uh, skin dynamics, for example, sweating, conductivity being one of the ways in which we can deal with that. And of course, the mechanical transductive, it's called nowadays, mechanical loading on the rare segment as well. So we have this idea that there's a kind of stimulation of receptors creates this kind of like change in the actual uh, dynamic of the resting potential of the nerves, creating what's called this neurophysiological um, um, lens. And of course, the effect of this is you know, not just purely localized, but can reflect through the whole system as well. Sorry about the typo. And again, now we have this 1976 Patterson, very important relating to the actual mechanism behind the genesis of that spinal facilitation and adapting that in terms of the So, in terms of the, the, the relationship of the spinal neural pathways and uh, the afferent in relationship, the afferent and ascending and descending success segment for the anastomic uh, branches. Of the, uh, relationship to that and how that relationship begins to become involved in the actual higher centers in the brain and this whole concept of center center sensitization although actually core you know had that concept as well in terms of the idea of um, 
sense of sensitization as well. And of course, uh, Busnik uh, developed on, on that and, and, and developed the concept of uh, sensory neurons and their reflexes causing motility restricts and visceral neurological and autonomic changes. So we go beyond the realm of just purely the, um, the physiology and terms of the fluid dynamics, but going on to terms of the actual you know, humoral and uh, the neurological and autonomic parameters and that are very relevant to our idea of what we use for the sense today. Okay, um, let's have a look at this dilemma that we're looking at, we're going back to this idea also, that, you know, today's um, osteopathy, you know, we're relying on a lot of time on this palpatory reliability, and there are, you know, kind of like thoughts that maybe that we are not so efficient uh, at our inter-practitional, inter inter-integer inter reliability amongst ourselves, our, uh, our peers, um, and that's, um, you know, some aspects of our population can be you know, subjective rather than, uh, than objective. Um, so, you know, in answer to that, I just wanted to sh say, show you some research that has been used to uh, you know, like, uh, endorse that, uh, the significance of our patients and how that relates to the lesion as well. So, this is one of them, um, the largest spinal motion palpation, determined at the location of stiffness, spinal size of wounds by confidence ratings. This is basically a scenario where there was um, various randomized parameters that were created um, where, which were compared to um, actual um, uh, real, real uh, palpatory findings so that there was a formula created that there would be like um, a comparison between the random potential for someone to just find a lesion, pure ad randomness, and compared to actual segmental um, stiffness analysis in relationship to functional movement. So that kind of like created um, a comparative dynamic within the parameters of the research uh, uh, formula, you might say. And it created the um, results that we see effectively on that right hand side, where we look at the SSS, which is the segmental um, uh, activity in relationship to the actual palpation, segmental. Uh, stiffness parameters that they were finding. So that's just one example I just wanted to, to relate to. Another one which is of interest to me was also the fact that, you know, component of our uh, perception of, 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 the, of the lesion state and our palpatory findings is very dependent on, you know, palpable, what's called palpable tactile acuity. You know, what is happening in terms of our refined uh, uh, fibers in our fingers in terms of the uh, specific uh, receptors that we have there and how that compares to that of the palm in relationship to the fingers. So it's very important that we, when we're engaging in evaluating these soft tissue presentations through the dynamic of movement, which is palpation, that we consider the fact that you know, and there is a discrepancy between regions of our hand and the fact that our thresholds vary according to our, us individually. So what my palpation might perceive is slightly different to someone else's. So that our kind of uniformity of palpation palpation um, parameters can be a little bit kind of like um, changeable or variable according to uh, certain parameters. So let's have a look at that. Oh, wait a second. There should have been a diagram of that somewhere. I think the slides have gone out of sequence. We just have to deal with. So basically, I think that's that's covered um, on the the other slide, um, which is with the other updated notes, and that basically looked at the influences of uh, various aspects contributing to the nature of, 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 of uh, tissue receptor and palpation and various um, uh, conductive D fibers and things, etc. I'm sure that's going to be covered in the material. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so another component of our dilemma is the structural biochemical model is under question. Do we have this whole scenario, you know, of the biomechanical influence, you know, influencing our decision making in addressing our patients as a, as a valid component? Um, yes, it is. It's still there, but you know, it's been generally challenged um, by various various, uh, various uh, fields of interest, especially in neuroscience specifically. And also those relating to the idea of other, other concepts in, in, our, in our work. So one of these things, one of the people that uh, has been visibly, visibly busy with the, you know, generally addressing various components of somatic 
function is Gary Fryer, and he's come up with this kind of like whole idea that there is more more of a um, uh, more of a dynamic or central 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 sensitizational processes going on where the actual parameters of uh, the dynamic of the lesion go beyond you know just purely the local reflex. Um, but you know within the context of our classical idea, you know we, we relate to heads law and we relate to Hilton's law, and that talks about higher centers, lower centers, integration. So, you know, there are parallels there that, you know, we need to kind of like look back at and refer to when we look at this contemporary literature too. So this becomes very interesting in terms of the idea of this pain, emotional receptive drive, and how that influences the dynamic of the lesion. And this kind of like central centralization can be typically seen within the context of our patients that we might address with ventral general neuralgia. And if you look at the diagram here, sorry about that, takes in the middle of it, um, we get this scenario where there's this kind of like central sensitization where the actual uh, nociceptive stimulus becomes so great that the actual, the actual thalamic function is changed um, to an extent that the body also almost becomes a central sensor sensitization uh, uh, dynamic so that the body is almost expecting or has kind of like recalled the pain even before it's there. So you get this typical scenario, maybe patients come in or presenting with a, nothing to obviously see in terms of uh, palpatory observation, but there is this kind of pain dynamic. And this is quite often something that you, you see or are in, um, as a phenomenon within the context of trigeminal niagara and the actual sensitization of the nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. So that's all in the material. The interesting thing is that there's a new skill to schematic. If you look at this, concept here. Somatic dysfunction is considered a central concept to the very end practice of osteopathy, whilst its relevance to the modern profession is questionable due to the unclear pathophysiological and poor reliability of detection. So that's, you know, arguable. Um, it would be nice to see if we can do some more research to kind of like clarify that or support, you know, that idea that, you know, palpation, functional dynamic testing is still, you know, valid in our work as we know it is. Um, but also, you know, He's going to explain it develops in terms of just involving that energy receptor synthesization model too. So that becomes very interesting in terms of how we might look at uh, this whole field of uh, the, the extension of the, the idea of the osteopathic lesion to the energy receptor stimulus. And this is a diagram that's there. As you can see, it doesn't exclude um, the potential for, for structural dynamical problems or um, you know, trauma or tissue relationships to the segments themselves or the spinal structures themselves but kind of overlaps this concept of nociceptive activation and the whole idea of central side sensitization and that schematic quite, quite often is something uh, that is it of, of interest and um, when we're dealing with this whole idea of perhaps unresolved sensitization or sensitivity within the patient or the presenting symptom patterns that we see as well so hopefully this is of value to you and may not necessarily be seen as a as a, a challenge, but an extension to the idea of what we look at in terms of the lesion. Again, this has also been uh, developed by in the neurofascial plane or um, the uh, neurofasciogenic model of uh, uh, the neurological influences related to fascial and interoception and various components of uh, stimulus associated with the. And again, an extension of the somatic uh, side of things. Um, biomechanical theory model, you've got the documentation there, you can read it in your own time. I'm running out of time. So effectively, we're looking at, you know, is there, is there a need for a change or is it just, you know, allowing us to encourage, you know, new neuroscience to be applied within the context to actually um, give evidence, I suppose, or give clarification behind what's going on. You're not necessarily seen as a, as, as, an, as, as a way of challenging our concepts or concepts that have been taught to us in the past. So again, oh, I'm sorry about these diagrams, they're going to work the place, but the diagram representation there is illustrative of that. And again, this one, ah, I'm so sorry, the setup of this has gone wrong since this morning. But effectively, you'll have these charts and the images you can look at as you're reading this. But the whole idea is that we've had this whole concept now that there is this fascial um, mechanism or potential fascial mechanism where we have sensory afferents within the 
the dynamic of the fascia that perceive some kind of stimulus that can also kind of like reinforce or overlap on that whole concept of that the dynamic of the lesion itself in terms of the afrogenous receptive dynamic as well. And through the parameters of dealing with myofascial uh, uh, treatments, we can begin to address that too, which is of course something we do within the context of the body adjustment all the time. We just don't say that we are fascial therapists. It's a, you know, it's, a, it's a component of what we're doing. Okay, so this is the uh, idea. And of course, the whole idea of synthesization and interoception, that's something that's also very valuable in terms of where we're dealing with components of the lesion as well. So, you know, what is happening in terms of peripheral tissues, how that is being relayed to the actual tissues of the center of our body or the organs in the viscera themselves. And that brings in that whole idea of the sensory afferent side of the vagal nerve, as well as the uh, whole idea of uh, the mediation of inflammation, for example, for the splanchnic sympathetic side and the changes in the inflammatory side to chitin responses, for example, that goes on and on. So there we have it, some aspects of that in terms of interception, synthesization as well, and the whole concept of the idea picked up by Craig. You know, and within the context of our treatment, we are addressing this anyway, but it's interesting to see how that you know, correlates to this concept of the uh, idea of uh, the sensitization and the mechanisms behind that too. So I'll leave you to look at that documentation and my slides in your own time. And again, ah, this, this has gone out of context. I'm sorry. So basically, going back to the fingertips now, I know my slides from all over the place, but I'm sure that the final version that you have is all correlated properly. I had a bit of a glitch from my computer this morning. So, fingertip palpation versus palmal palpation, trust or somatosensory impression. All these components are very interesting when we look at the, nesses, the, nat the nature of our palpation and how these kind of influence the result or the perception of palpation of the lesion that we find. Again, there's other ideas where, for example, you know, we must maybe consider out, um, consider what we're doing to going outside the domain of just purely the structural model. But again, my argument is the structural model is just one component of what we're doing, um, and unfortunately, it's been kind of like isolated and analysed to death. And you know, we as classical osteopaths just purely see the structural osteopaths. That is not the case. You know, we're relying on that whole relationship of you know, structural influencing the biomechanical influence and the neurophysiological influence the whole of the parameters involved in what we're doing. And you know for me to be called to consider as a structural osteopath is just like kind of like for me. It's like as if I'm I'm a kindergarten osteopath. It's not relevant. But unfortunately it's picked up a couple on and related to in the context of both research and, and to that too. So you know later men he looked at various components of this and then looked at this whole process approach, which is very valuable. I mean, I utilize that in the context of my national applications anyway, but I don't call it process to put process to put that process of, uh, approach because, you know, it's integral, parts of it are integral to, to what I've been doing. And, you know, here is a comparison for you to look at in terms of, you know, this whole idea of self structural model being self-healing, which is the same as the process approach. But you know, we can get these comparisons that kind of like patient determined management goals. Well, you know, we're not gonna kind of like say to a patient, hey, do this exercise and that's it. No, we're gonna give them motivated, motivational based exercise that perhaps if we do, gives them encouragement, gives them working within certain fields of achievement. And um, I don't like the idea of specific tasks or goals because you know if they don't make that goal, how do they feel? You know, I like to, for example, with my MS patients, encourage them to be, you know, self-motivated, provide a dynamic of movement that they can find valuable to their rehabilitation. Not rehabilitation, but rehabilitation. Anyway, let's continue just for a short time. Um, oh, that's it. Thanks for listening, everyone. Sorry. I'm sorry about the um, slides being slightly out of phase. I'll make sure that they're really phase when you've got them. Any questions and questions out there? We've got a few moments in time for anybody. I'm sorry it's been slightly rushed, but uh, um, hopefully we've kind of like covered the essentials of the lesion, we've covered some new concepts, and also, you know, some of our typical dilemmas that we have. You know, where do we start? What type of lesion are we, uh, is presenting to us? Is it acute? Is it chronic? You know, is there facilitation, etc.? 
Um, and the nice thing about you know the context within the within the context of application and body, the body adjustment as a, as an approach is that we're dealing with these components and addressing them in terms of tissue fields, quality of movement, and we're doing it in a gentle, subtle way uh, to provoke and evoke some kind of physiological response to the benefit of the patient. That's what we all do as a but you know this is the nice parameter that we can utilize. Okay, there we are, continuous. Diego, any questions or, or is yeah. um, any uh, there? Anybody has got any questions for Tim? Very interesting lecture, Tim. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a bit comp complex. Well, not complex, but a bit comprehensive. But it gives the essentials. Of people it is such a difficult subject. In, and yeah. Over that within one hour is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm probably <laughs> done too much, but you know me, I'm always an enthusiastic uh, uh, trying to relate to the concepts in, 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 in application. That's most important. No, but it was interesting, yeah. Do you have anyone, any questions for Tim? Hopefully, the link is there, um, and I'm sure I'll give it to uh, Cindy to put on. Um, so, and I will activate it so that the, the information is there and the presentation is there. And I'll make sure that those two slides of the I'll sync go back into sync. But it becomes interesting when you look at the um, idea of you know the pathway, the development of the pathway in these ideas and lesion lesionology or the science of lesion lesion. Um, and how you know a lot of these kind of like the contemporary ideas quite often reflect on, on ideas of the, uh, that were contributed by other people but weren't able to be developed because of the you know, materials or resources. Time with there. And you know, the scenario that is tricky for me to address is the fact that you know it's quite often people go back to that and they are very critical of the, the methodology, but at the same time, it was the only methodology that was appropriate at the time because it wasn't available that can we could develop upon those ideas. You know, so you know, it's, it's you know, for me it's interesting to connect the dots and try to see how um, our our children can develop and uh, adapt and apply new thoughts, but in a positive context rather than just purely an alternative context. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think uh, the, the, in classical osteopathy, what we have about biomechanics is, is fundamental, it's very good. Yes. And of course, you can bring other stuff in. Uh, but because we have that, uh, I think, in my opinion, that basement so clear, so. Uh, so profound. Yeah. It worked very well. Yeah, I think it's what's in interesting about the dynamic of our work and, and, and this kind of like, um, but this, this method of approach that we have is that it, it, it interfaces all these, these, these ideas from today. Um, but it's always already been there from the beginning. So the funny scenario is, is that all these concepts have been kind of like, compartmentalized or they've been kind of put into different different field, fields of specialization or under a different category but it's all you know from the beginning it's very similar um, and you know when patients here say do you do fascial work I'll say yeah fine I do fascial work but they say to me oh but you haven't got the sign that your fascial therapist outside and I'll say well, okay do you want me to talk about fascia or you know another scenario when I'm talking to my, to my, my, um, my healthcare colleagues next door they want to know, you know, what are, what are these terms when, you know, the patients come to me and they're being treated and they have a reaction and, you know, they've been told that they've had their liver balanced and it's like, well, what is this? You know, what is this kind of like dialogue that mm. presented to them? And, um, so, you know, I like to clarify what that context of that liver balance I mean, may yeah, be. The, you know, the, the, the slide that you had of Little John, he covered all those um, four or five different points. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very much so, um, and it's interesting when you look at the material that you know you you, you have this whole concept of uh, you know this dynamic of gene expression changes as a consequence. Let I make a kind of a transduction slide, for example. You know we talk about this whole dynamic of uh, the bioplasmic bioplasm and, and diamondization of the bioplasmic plane. It sounds really wacky, but effectively what it is is just that kind of like whole dynamic of how that intercellular, extracellular matrix dynamic is changing according to the nature of the stimulus we give it. You yeah. know, and the cell dynamic itself comes from that which is poor in its functionality to being enriched in its functionality through changing the environment in which it's in. 
Um, and we do that through the process of you know, moving tissues around and, and providing nutrition to not just purely you know, tissue fields, but actual cells themselves. You know? So that's you know, a fascination. So there's lots of connecting links going on there. I find it was fascinating. Another aspect I, I find interesting when you were explaining about the biomechanics of the sacrum with the lumbar spine is mm. I keep repeating to, to people is uh, we, we normally forget that L5 is, uh, is a pivot for us. Yes. Normally in the compress, compression from the spine above. Mm. Normally, um, you know, this theory is, is fine, but mm. we normally find L5 just compressed. It's always, it always tends to be in that scenario of adaptive compression to some degree because it's that ultimate final pathway of gravity loading through the whole spinal column going into that you know, it's relatively solid pelvic ring. So you know, this has to be distortion. And, you know, we've got this vestibular apparatus going on trying to maintain our, you know, our, our, our level, but at the same time, our body is desperately trying to re-establish that gravity, central gravity dynamic, so it's reducing providing less effort for us to physiologically you know, yeah. stay, stay, stay upright. And you know, it's interesting to see, maybe as a comparative study, to see what happens when you have, for example, I know it's probably not ethically right, but you have, I guess what visually impaired, impaired um, um, people uh, uh, in Hereford at the Center for the Blind, and it was very curious to see how the dynamic of their bodies changed in relationship to someone else I was treating in comparison to someone that related to that. You know, I know it's not necessarily visual cue all the time, but the vestibular relates to that visual cue as well. So there's a slight sort of dynamic there. So there's lots of parameters that can be addressed, you know, and can look yeah. Um, But yeah, I mean, yeah. Any questions out there? Or, or, or they, they can, you know, people can leave questions and I can get back to them if they want me to. Okay. At any stage. So anyway, I hope everybody's kind of like enjoyed a little bit of that. Um, and it's, you know, putting it all into context, it's a review, but at the same time, you know, there are lots of interesting articles out there that are quite complex, but at the same time, you know, they all fall into the category of, of, of what we are doing within the context of treatment as well. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, to okay. You. Okay. Thank you Indy, for uh, allowing us to have yeah, to use this uh, question. And thank you to everyone who was uh, participating here, connected. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to let you know that in September we will have another uh, webinar with uh, Chris Button. So yeah, what to that? Classic, uh, classical osteopathic treatment. That will be on the 13th of uh, September. And then the idea is to have um, uh, different webinars al along the year, every, every two or three months, something like that, bring different tutors. So, uh, but first one with Tim. So, thank you very much. It's okay. Well, I've enjoyed that. Um, as I said, materials available to people on that link that I gave you and and can be as well. So, really, I'm welcome to take material from there. Okay. okay. All right. Then. All right. All right. Thanks see very you. much. I'll see you. I'll see you soon. See you yeah. Soon. Okay. Bye. Bye. See you soon. Bye. Bye.